And that's why the theme of this message, the next three weeks, will be Reset Church. Because I believe God wants to reset church in our mindset, what church is all about. Because when you look at the church three and a half thousand, more than uh, 2,000 years ago, all of a sudden the church went from the upper room to the marketplace. It was this close-knit disciple group dispersing into society and making a difference, planting churches, bringing the life of Christ to humanity. We saw Thomas go to India, and, and, and okay, James, he started a church in Jerusalem, but all the other disciples went all over. And the church became a church without walls. Because that's the mandate. The mandate is to be salt and be light. And, and somewhere down the line, things happened to us, and church got a different definition. The church became, it's us against them. It's the holy against the unholy. It is, it is separation. It is, it, is, it is bad versus good. Am I right, family? When you talk about the world outside, it means like those guys, those people, the ungodly, the unsaved, the unrighteous. And we in church are all the righteous ones, and God loves us, and Jesus died for us. But that's not the whole truth. Jesus died for humanity. Jesus died for men and women. People are the crown of God's creation. So I just want to reset your mind what church is about. And I hope you, this morning, you will give me a clean slate. Just put my, my sound is not right yet. Give me a clean slate that, that I can speak to you and that you can hear what I'm saying this morning. Because I believe God wants to reset in your mind and in my mind what is church. We know church is not the building. We know we are church. But what is the function? What is the meaning? What is the why of church? And when you lose your why, you lose your passion. If someone asks you, why don't you go to gym? What does it mean? You don't go to gym. You lose your passion to stand up in the morning, 5 o'clock to go to gym. So the why of church, because we all know if you put on the radio, we look on the TV, the social media, the world is in a mess. The world is broken. People are hurting. And only, rest only restoration, the only source of hope is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus is hope. Christ in us the hope of glory. But yes, the challenge, family. Not many people know about church. You know, I'm away from Mayerton on the R59. I want to tell you today is a biker's day. The bikers is going somewhere. I'm not they're going to Paris or the Naysville or somewhere or Clarence. But let me tell you, the bikers were in droves going up that side to Midvall. And then there's some, class, some, some car collections, a few Porsches. You can see those guys are um, they in, they're, they're in this Porsche club. And they're on their way somewhere. And I wondered by myself, does the community, if this church closes down, if you change the job called church, you change the job, does your fellow Workers miss you. Will this community miss this church when this church closed down? Because the world can live without church. It still turns. They still go places. They go sleep tonight, have bribes. So church in Acts was a church of impact. They made a difference. People looked at him and, and said, wow, what do you have? So that's why I want to ask this morning to understand. And I want to give you a picture. I want to reset your mind. The church is not against, or let me tell you, church is not us against the world. It's not, a, it's not holy against unholy. Church is about good news of Jesus Christ. And everybody needs to know and to hear this good news. Let me read you a scripture, then I'll build further uh, on there. Jeremiah 29 Four to seven. If I say Jeremiah, which, which verse comes to mind? 29.11. What does it say, 29.11? Yes, your future. It's not a future of evil, but hope. God says, listen, I'm going to be with you forever. I want you to have a hopeful future. So in context of that scripture, Jeremiah 20, 29.11, let me just backpedal a bit. 
and see where these inhabitants of Jerusalem find themselves. Let's call them the church for argument's sake. Let's call them Christians. Where does these Christians, these inhabitants of Jerusalem find themselves? They find themselves in Babylon. Bad space. Bad people in the natural. My sound is not right. Bad space. I just, I just told you the womb when I speak. Is, 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 I'm only the guy, maybe my ears. Is that okay? Is, is the sound okay to you? Okay, thanks. The sound is okay. <laughs> maybe I need some, something better. Maybe I'm, <laughs> maybe I'm just aging. Amen. Pray for your pastor, please. Pray for me. So, that is, that is the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They were this close knit family. They were just Christians. They enjoyed. There was a different lingo. They, they were speaking the same language about Jesus and, and that kind of stuff, you know, and he's good to us. And, and then there was the world outside. And all of a sudden, Jesus, this, those inhabitants of Jerusalem find themselves in Babylon. Stay with me of the picture. You have this close knit Christian group of friends. You have this close Christian group of, of work colleagues with you. And all of a sudden, you need to change the job. All of a sudden, you go to a different workspace. And you find yourself amongst the heathen. Amongst the unsaved. They swear. They steal your psalmies lunchtime. And what is your natural reaction is to withdraw. That's our human response to I don't like. I don't want to be part. I withdraw. But you see, this inhabitants of Jerusalem, this church couldn't withdraw. Let me read to you, Jeremiah 29, 4. This is what the Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses, settle down, plant gardens, and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters into marriage. So they may too. Have sons and daughters. Increase in number. Numbers there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Listen to this. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. So he has this, this group of people used to a certain way of living, a certain way of culture, a certain way of doing. A certain way of speaking. All of a sudden, they find themselves in this different space. And the, and the first inclination is to withdraw. And, and God says, I've placed you there. And I want you to function in society. Listen, family. God wants the church to function in community. In that workspace, wherever you live, whatever you call your community. It can be Marbotton. It can be, it can be King Vista. It can be uh, Oak Dean or uh, Lynn Mayer. Whatever your community is, God wants you to function there. That is important to God. God wants them to, to witness there, to, to live there, to have an impact there. Because the mindset we have, as soon as we talk about church and world, we qualify world as very sinful, anti-God, anti-whatever else, very unholy. And God wants to reset because the church is light. Another way for light to have effectiveness, the only reason for light is when there's darkness. And you will never grow as a Christian in a certain atmosphere. You'll never know how much light is in you until you meet darkness. Instead of withdrawing out of your community, get involved in your community. Reset church, because you are the church. This is just a building. And must we come to church? Building, yes. The Bible says in Hebrew 10, 25, do not forsake the assemblies of God. As some have the habit, but encourage one another, stir one another up until we see this in time unfolds in our life. So building is important, but more important than building is you, the church. Reset church. It's not us against them. It's not good against bad. It's not when you leave church, you live into this mission field that they're gonna they are to get you. You know, who gets who first? That is not a mindset. It's not the biblical mindset of church. Think about those in the upper room. They lived with Jesus three and a half years. They filled with the Holy Spirit. And now Jesus says to them the following. 
Go and preach the gospel. Get out of there. Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, and to the end of the earth. Move out of here. Don't be this holy huddle. And you'll be my witnesses. You'll be my witnesses. Family, the church is the witness of the goodness of Jesus Christ. Your community needs you. That guy where you buy your vegetables every day needs you to see a smile on your face, to see that you have a different attitude that's happening in the world right now. How many of you know you cannot control what's happening in the world right now? I wish we could stop the, the war between Ukraine and Russia because of the gas prices, because of the shortages of certain, certain food products and stuff. But we don't have control. We don't have control about, over corruption. You don't have control about many things. But what you do have control of is your testimony. You can decide to share life with people or not. And that's why you need to reset church. Because you are the church, and when you find yourself in that environment, God wants you to be light and salt. Actually, um, this is just my translation. God says to him, listen, you're going to be in exile for 70 years. You're going to be in this space that you don't like for 70 years. So change your attitude. Marry. Bold. Get involved. Listen, Jesus is coming for his church. I don't know when, but he's coming. But until he comes, he says, get involved. Build houses, plant, marry. I know, I know immediately you've got a script in your mind. No, no, not unequally yoked. Christian cannot marry a non-Christian. That's fine. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying get involved in your community. Don't make it a separation thing. Segregation thing. Us against them. It's not biblical family. Can I have an amen? Is that, are you okay? Are you, you still there? Because let me tell you something. The church came from the community. You and me were part of a community when we got saved. We weren't born church. We were in a community. And we got saved out of our community to go back to our community to make a difference. But when I got saved, when, the, when they took me in my discipleship, one of the things they told me is, you have to leave your friends. Get out of your community. Get out of that bad spaces, those people with bad habits, because they're going to corrupt your good habits. And maybe, maybe it was true or not, but I don't know now anymore. Because when I look at Jesus, that's holy, touches unholy, the unholy becomes holy. Amen. Now I'm old, I'm 75, and I don't have unsafe friends. And can, can I tell you something? Christians are not always the good friends to have. Because as soon as you get a Christian friend, they measure you. I oh, didn't expect you. Wow, did you say, did you, did, can you believe it? Listen, your, your worldly friends, they enjoyed you. When you had a few beers, they laughed with you. When you danced on the tables, they cheered you on. You get a bit of weird as a Christian, hey, they excommunicate you, man. Don't mix with that guy. He's weird. Don't mix with her. She goes in the dark, man. Family, we came from society. We came from some community. And we became church. And can I tell you, our relationship with Jesus is the bride of Christ. You are the bride of Christ. But your work ethics is bond servants. Bond servants of the Lord. And we just get all mixed up. We feel that we can be defiled because of this bad world we live in. No, we are bond servants of the Lord. And God wants you to make a difference in the lives of people. Everything can go down, but a church needs to grow. Because we are agents of hope. I was on a webinar this week, on a, on a Wednesday. And this pastor, I haven't met him in person. First time I've seen him. Spoke to other pastors on this webinar. And he said, what COVID has stolen from the church is hope. But because COVID didn't only steal the pews hope. The members' hope. COVID stole the pastor's hope. Many churches closed down. Many pastors are suffering. And I said, we need to restore that. That this is, we are still the agents of hope. Because we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. And he spoke about us to be fruitful in our areas of living. To impact our society. To make disciples. Can I tell you this morning, it's not the gift of evangelism. It's obedient to evangelized. 
Reset church. Reset church. Can I ask you a question this morning? If you get removed from your workspace, if this church is not effective in our community, will they miss you? Will they, will they say, I'm so sorry you're leaving? Man, when I, when I had a bad time, I couldn't wait for Monday to meet you again. When, when, when I had a bad time, I, when I see your face on a, on a Wednesday morning, I was so glad I'm at work. Because you're always joyful. There was always hope in your eyes. You always gave me a pat on my back. You always encouraged me that life can be better. Or do we look like the world on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and praise God by Sunday, He revives us again for the next week. So yeah, in Jeremiah, God gives us a strategy. He gives the inhabitants of Jerusalem a strategy. He says, listen, serve your community. How? By serving me. See, when you serve God, by serving your community. See, the intentions of, of those inhabitants of Jerusalem, God says, get involved in that space that I've placed you in. You're there for a reason. You might not understand it, but you're there for a reason, so get involved, family. I'm going to ask you, when last were you involved in anything? I made a decision, my, while I was preparing this week, that there would be no pothole in my road where I live. I will start impacting my street. I cannot impact the whole of Raceview. I wanted to, yes. May the, may the grace of God help us to impact Bessonia. I'm about in Glavista. But just think about this. If you drive down a road in your street and there's a pothole, stop cursing the government and get involved in your community. Take your wheelbarrow and fill up that pothole and say, listen, I want to bet you, when you put your wheelbarrow down and fill that pothole, hey, all the guys out of, out, of, out of your neighbors will come to the street. And you've got a time to testify to them. So listen, this is our neighborhood. Let's keep it up. But you know how, how we're involved in our neighborhood? Let's say, for instance, they break into your neighbor. Our first reaction is to get better security at our house. Not to better the neighborhood, not to do prayer riots and prayer walks, not to go to your, minute, your neighbor and say, listen, can I pray for you? Let, let's, let's thank God for this or there's hope. No, immediately get a new dog. Get new camera systems. Let's get stasis. Family, we need to reset church. God says to those inhabitants of Jerusalem, you're in Babylon. You might not understand why, but I want you to go forward in that space. I want you to become responsible citizens. God has given them the green light to take up positions in society, in community. I want to tell your family, if God promotes you in your job, it's the green light to have influence and influence people. God wants you to excel in life. In, in this world, your position, your status give you influences. So you get a raise in your position at work. Don't see it as a more salary. Don't see it as a, as a bigger car. See it as influence. Say, now I can serve even in a better level, in a higher level. That strategy God gave the inhabitants of Jerusalem in, in Babylon, it's still the same today. God wants us. To be in our communities because where you are, church is. I mean, Aina, Icona, Halibaba, Honolulu, something, please help me. I don't know why I'm excited about this message. You're not excited, I can see it. But I'm excited. I say, Lord, please help me to reset my mind. Help me to understand why I've got saved, why I've got born again. Help me to understand why I have a testimony. Why do I go through stuff in my life? It's to encourage someone else that's going through. So I want to challenge you, family. There was a Daniel. In that time of Jeremiah, there was a guy called Daniel. We all know Daniel. He was a guy that prayed three times. He was a guy that ended up in alliance then. But he's always, the, always also a guy that changed the whole nation at that time. The king decreed the God of Daniel is the God to be served. He was involved in community. He used his position to influence. So Daniel became the face of God in Babylon. 
Daniel redefined God to a, situ- to a community that doesn't know God. Can I tell you something? Family, in your community, you need to redefine who God is. Because in some communities, they believe God is not almighty. God is not omnipotent. God is not omnipresent. And we need to redefine who God really is in that community. That God still cares, that God still saves, that God still heals. Daniel did it. He didn't mind being thrown into the lion's den. It was part of the testimony. You're going to get into bad spaces. You, you, you're not going to always be cheered on. Because we live in a narrow way. We believe in a narrow door. And that's why people look at you and say you're narrow-minded. It is okay. We still believe Jesus is the only way to truth and the light. They did, I, heard, I read this article about people in church, Christians in America. Let's blame them, not South Africa, in America. Believers had been born for many years. There was an uh, uh, answering sheet that one of the questions was, do you still believe that Jesus is the only way to the Father? People in church need to answer that. And over 45% says no. We believe that Jesus is a way to God, but there's many other ways to God. How can, you, how can you be so corrupted in church, believing that it's not only Jesus anymore? It was in the beginning in your life, but now all of a sudden being saved many years and living in a society that we need to, we need to accept a lot of things, we, we, we just went a little bit of, off the rail. And say, no, well, there's a lot of things going. There's just one God, but many roads. There's one heaven, but many roads. And then we use the natural language, and there's many ways to travel to Cape Town. You can go by car, by train, by flight, by walk, by whatever. And we use this analogy to try to explain and justify what we are saying. But God says, redefine my face in your community. Redefine my face in your family members, in, in your household where you function. In. Redefine me. Let the people see the real God of the real Bible. Because we are agents of hope. We are called to bless because we are a blessing. Amen? Amen. That's what we got born again. Daniel was a person of influence and that's why God created a position of influence to him. God wants us to understand, family. He showed by his life and by his wisdom how transformation can take place. Listen, people are looking at your life. You know, many times I've said this from this pulpit, it's not what you say, it's what you do that matters. People will forget what you say. I mean, we married for a few years now, like 34 years, and we forget what we say. And says, you said, I said, never said it. But you did it. Okay, I did it. But I didn't say it. See, we can argue what I said, but we can never argue what I did. And that's why, church, we need to start doing something in our community. Let us not talk about Jesus, but let's do Jesus in our community. Amen? Amen. Say, do Jesus. Do Jesus. Oh, I'm so glad your tongue also, also just like knotted. Do, do, do Jesus. Say it fast. Do Jesus. Do Jesus, do Jesus, do Jesus. Do Jesus. Do Jesus. Okay, now you guys are much cleverer than I. But you see, Daniel... His influence was real because his life was an example. Can't, can't we go back to Reset Church? The, the guys in Upper and they, they couldn't hide. They, they couldn't hide behind the walls anymore. They were so on fire. They were open. And people mocked them and people cursed them, but they, but they couldn't resist because love compelled them. This new gospel, this new experience, this, this witnessing of the Holy Spirit, couldn't, could, they couldn't be quenched. And think about your life when you got born again, how excited you was to be a Christian. It didn't matter who you speak to, when you speak to, how you spoke about Jesus, because Jesus was the Alpha and Omega. And many times now, Jesus is still the Alpha. You begin with Jesus, but He's not Omega anymore. We don't end in Jesus anymore. We just water down our gospel. And we have these words that Jesus will understand. Can I share something personal with you? On our way back from Midval, I had a conversation with myself in my head. I can't tell what I said. But I was thinking about stuff and I was, I was like, I was like. (laughs) 
uh, in my head now, eh? no words. And uh, all of a sudden, I looked at my right hand side, and there was a balloon. You know that balloon that, that's, got, that's got helium in it? And it was a five. A five. And I, it caught my eye on my right hand side. I was looking at this golden balloon, a number five. And as uh, it's in this conversation in my mind, like, I heard the Spirit say to me, it's by grace. It's by grace. It's by grace. And immediately this, the storm inside of me just went to rest. It's not by power, nor by might, but by the Spirit. Amen. And that's what the upper room Christians experience. Peter chopped off a guy's ear. Because he wanted to protect Jesus. He wanted to protect the reputation of Jesus. He wanted to show Jesus, I'm with you, Jesus. I'll give my life for you. And we all know he lied, but let's just pretend. Uh, I'm going to do this, Jesus, for you. And then you have the scriptures. Not by power, Peter. Not by might, but by my spirit. And when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, I couldn't help themselves to get involved in community. They couldn't help it when they walked and there was, a, there was a lady of divination, of divination saying, these are the men of God, follow them, listen to their teachings. And when he turned around, and, uh, Paul, and looked at his lady and said, come out of here, you spirit of divination. And he influenced community because he became light and salt. Are we light and salt, family? Do we influence our community to the better? You see, because Daniel changed Babylon's perception of God. Because they served a lot of gods. But when they saw the real God of Daniel that closed the lion's mouth, they said, this is the God. There's a lot of gods, but this is the God. And I want to tell you, it's time that the church proclaim the God again. The dark God that created heaven and earth. The God that does not sleep. The God will never forsake you nor leave you. The God that gave His only Son so that you cannot die but have life eternally. That's the God we need to proclaim, family. Daniel placed the church in that community to make a difference. He became light and salt in that community. But what caught me most of this description, Jeremiah 29, 4-7, I read, is the last verse in verse, 20, uh, verse 7. Let me read it to you again. It says here, Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile, Pray to the Lord for it. Pray for what? Pray for your city. Pray for Glenanda. Pray for Glen Vista. Pray for Raceview. Pray for Alberton. Pray for, pray for Augsburg, where my friend stays. Pray for your city. Then he, God clarifies why He puts a burden on us for prayer and getting involved in our community. He says, pray for the Lord because if it prospers, you will prosper also. Listen, when, there's a, when, there's, when I went to a, a, a certain town, there was a big factory, factory there that gave a lot of people of that community worked at that specific factory. And when it closes down, it affects the community. Yes, the principle. Pray for your community because out of your community will you prosper. Your prospering, your welfare comes from your community. Seek the welfare of your community. Jesus, God said to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, you are in Babylon, but seek the welfare of that city you're living in. Don't curse that city. Don't judge that city. But pray for the welfare. If you live in a townhouse complex, don't go visit a body, body corporate every five hours when someone has a party in a complex. Pray for them. Reach out to that person. Ask them to invite you to the next party. You can just hang around there, man, and look cool. Someone's going to talk to you. Someone's going to ask you, hey, who, I don't know you. Who are you? It's an hour from 25, man. Oh, what do you do for a living? Well, I'm a Christian for a living. Because <laughs> that's how we need to answer these people these days. No, oh, I'm, I'm a mechanic or I'm a doctor. No, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. That's where we live. We live by the power of our words. We found identity in occupation. No, we found identity in relationship. I'm a believer. God is my father. Seek the wealth of the city. Why? Because in Babylon's welfare, you will find your welfare. 
That's what, I, that's what God is teaching his inhabitants of Jerusalem. Don't withdraw. Don't get isolated. Pray and seek the welfare of Glenanda so that more, more shops can open and more, more places can be built. You know, we've been living now in Raceview for about since October last year. And there was open felt there. And every time I go to the past that open felt, in my heart, I, I, that person that stayed next to the open felt, I always said, man, they should do something about their fencing. Because they still got a four, 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 four foot wall. And I said to myself, there's no security. What must I do? Must I speak to them? Wow, what, what, what can I do? All of a sudden, they're building townhouses there now. So when I go past it, God, thank you for protecting those people. They're going to build townhouses now. Maybe people didn't have money to raise their fence. They had money to put up electric fences, building six-foot walls, eight-foot walls. Maybe. But I won't tell you. God wants you to get involved in your community. God will open your eyes to see stuff because He placed a burden on you. Not to bad mouth, but to pray. Maybe you see something at work. Not to bad mouth, not, not to pray. God says, overcome evil by doing good. We, 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 God, uh, God doesn't call us. And God didn't call us to be fruit inspectors. He called us to be fruit bearers. You need to have the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Amen? He didn't call us to be fruit inspectors. He, he, God wants us to change. Reset church. It's not about half full or half empty. When you see everything is half empty... There's a negativity connected to that. God wants you to say, listen, man, this is half full. We're halfway there. We're halfway there. It's not what you've lost. It's what's in a glass over that you can work upon. Amen? Let me give you a scripture to explain what I'm saying right now. 1 Corinthians 5, 12. And this is Paul speaking to the church of Corinth. To connect to society. To connect to their friend circle. To connect with their families. To connect with the unsafe. Because the church of Corinthians, when we start getting all the fruit of the Spirit and, and, uh, uh, and, the, and the gifts of the Spirit, they all, they all just, just want to glow in the dark. He says, listen, you cannot glow in the dark by yourself. You need to get involved in your community. And then he gives him this recipe, this tragedy, this, this word of truth. And he says, it isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders. Look, some translation says, non-believers. Why is it not your responsibility? Because I didn't sign up to be a Christian. For them to swear is not wrong. For them to take a bribe is not wrong. For them to, for them to, to whatever they do, not stop at stop treats, it's not wrong. No, it's wrong. Let me give you another illustration. They didn't sign up to be a Christian family. So all of a sudden the church became this judge over our societies. We decide what is open and what is closed. We, we, we judge the non-believer because they, they're doing certain stuff. And Paul says to this church, listen, don't judge them because they haven't signed up to live like you. They haven't signed up to be a Christian. They don't sign up to be a believer. You cannot be upset if your neighbor not coming to church because he's not born again. It's our responsibility to get involved in people's lives so that they can come to church. But listen, what he was, what else he says is, but... It certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. Paul listen, let me get it straight now. Church, let me get it straight. Don't judge your community, but judge one another. How much of Jesus is in your life? How much of Jesus is in my life? Why, why are we still doing certain stuff that's not applicable to a Christian living? That's what Paul says, yeah? He says, don't be judges of Babylon. Don't be judges of that society. They didn't sign up for this righteous walk. They didn't sign up to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. They're still dark. And the Bible says those who are dark will fall. They, those who are dark, you know, the blind person can lead a blind person and will go nowhere. So I want to reset your mind. Don't make it us against them. Paul says, listen, don't judge them. Can I say this? Abram was called to bless everyone, not to save everyone. Our covenant rights, that's from Genesis 12, from Abram, we are the seed of Abram, is to bless people. And in blessing people, some will come to repentance. The Bible says it's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. 
But someone needs to tell them how good God is. Reset church family. Remember this. Where there's no love, there's no influence. God wants you to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. God wants you to, to separate the behavior from the person. God wants you to separate the behavior from your society, your community, from the persons living in that community. We do it, in our, we do it in our, as, as parents. When, when, your, when your baby or your girl or your daughter, when they, when they, when they do a bit of wrong things, let's for instance, they say they take, they take cookies out of the cookie jar. Maybe your son is like 15 and he takes 100 bucks out of your wallet. You sit him down. And you say, what you've done is wrong. But I still love you. You don't say, come here, you thief. I caught you, eh? Who taught you? Who's your mother and your father? I was going to say, well, you. He said, no, I'm righteous. We don't do that to our children. We, call our, we don't call our children's names. You don't call your, 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 your son a thief or your daughter a thief. You separate their behavior from the person. And you say, listen, we, we don't do it this way. We, 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 you, know, we, you ask and I will give. And you take the Bible and you teach them. Knock and it shall be open. Ask and you shall receive. And then next Sunday will come and say, Dad, give me 100 bucks. Don't say no. Give him 100 bucks. <laughs> because you need to reinforce truth in his life. That's it. I see a few tears going, yes, Dad. <laughs> Buy this tape. Play to your parents. But God wants us to separate behavior from persons. Because if you look at people as, as, as their behavior, you're never going to reach out to people. Someone reached out to me, separating my behavior from the person. It's not you're doing wrong stuff, but Jesus loves you. And he's calling you. He wants you to come to him. He wants you to come to him. And I got saved. I got saved from my bad behaviors. Evangelism is easy, family. It's very simple to the core. The core of evangelism is a believer telling a non-believer how good Christ is to you. Amen? That's it. It's not telling someone that they're going to hell. You don't have to be a prophetic person to be evangelized. Or to evangelize a person. I can see your end result will be in pain. I can see you going this wrong road and it will lead to destruction. Just tell them how God good God is to you. Show them the good news of Jesus Christ. Show them. You know, the only reason we don't evangelize is because we're disobedient. Is that okay? That's the only reason. If you listen to the Holy Spirit, you will reach out to your family and friends. You will reach out to your community. The only reason we don't do it is because we're disobedient. Rather be disobedient and repent than use language like this, I've got no time. You know what, imp what, what implies when you say I've got no time? It means I see people going to hell and don't care. Reset church. Rather, rather just say, Lord, I'm disobedient. Forgive me, please. And, and fall on ground and, and ask God to repent for repentance. But don't say I don't have time. What Jack is saying, I can see people are lost and they're going the wrong way. And I know you're going to hell, but I don't care. Or, or, or maybe, you, maybe you're like this. You say, well, I don't have any unsafe friends anymore. Well, can I ask you, where do you buy your bread on a weekly basis? Ladies, where do you do your hair? Because I know you do your hair every week. Or your nails. And the new thing is like once a month, a nail, Tony. You have a nail, Tony. I wish I had a hairdresser, man, <laughs> to speak to. I, I, hear, I hear, you know, before you got saved, you got a barman. Now I've got saved, you can't speak to a barman anymore. You need to speak to your hairdresser. But I'm, I'm man, I'm, I, I haven't got a hairdresser. I'm just thinking, where can I go to now? <laughs> but I want you to understand this. Don't say you don't have unsafe friends. Where you purchase your milk. Where, 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 where you throw your picture in your car. Where you, where you walk every day. There's, there's people you see along the road every day. Everybody's got habits. Everybody made some people walk at six every morning. Get up and walk at six every morning. And meet them on their way. 
Say, so how are you doing? Well, I'm doing it. Where do we live? I live down the road. Well, we can do this every morning. Yes, we can. Oh, sure. Well, great. Come on, family. Reset church. But don't say I don't have unsaved friends. Don't say I don't have time. Rather just repent to God, I am disobedient. Why? Because you're blessed to be a blessing. You're an agent of hope. Amen? Amen. Through your life, God can bring transformation. Through, listen to Abram. Genesis 12, 1 to 4. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you and I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Talk about covenant. Talk about reset. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. God gave Abram a personal blessing. But also a national blessing. Also a community blessing. So I will bless you. And was Abram blessed? Yes. Very wealthy, sir. For Christians who have money, yes. Very wealthy, sir. Please. But the blessing part is to influence your community. So Abraham, I will bless you to be a blessing. There was a personal blessing, but it also was a natural blessing. There was a community blessing. Actually, what God is saying, listen, whatever I give you, I give charge. I, I, I beseech you to give it to your community. Be a channel. Be a channel. Don't be a dam. Don't just be a person that just accumulates because you'll never find validation in what you have. Transformation. Is what God is after. Transformation when God uses you to transform lives. Family. God wants us really to share life with people. Just to reach out to people. To touch the lives of people. You know, when you share your testimony, it says you care. When you tell someone in your neighborhood, in your workspace, in your community, this is what Jesus did, it just shows you care. And when you see a need, just meet that need, man. Because the Bible says God will bless you to be a blessing. And maybe you can understand this morning what I'm saying to you. You and I were healed to heal, found to be found, taught to teach, prayed for to pray for, empowered to empower. Comforted to comfort, accepted to accept, if forgiven to forgive, made whole to make whole, transformed to transform. Amen? Amen? God wants us, family, to reset our minds about church. Say reset church. Reset. It's not about us against them. It's not about good against e evil. Good or bad. It's not, it's not about, it's about saved and unsaved. Some people need to hear the gospel one time and get saved. Some need to hear the gospel a hundred times and get saved. Let us not be the judge thereof. And then quote scripture and say, I won't give my pulse to the pigs. The Bible says, testify in season and out of season. Because you are like a tree planted by streams of living water. Whose leaves does not wither. And whatever you do will prosper. It's not about them, it's about us. Finding our roots as a church in our community. Finding your roots as a Christian in your family, in your workspace, in your friends. Finding your roots as a mom and dad in your household. See your kids. Don't have to tell your kids, don't do what I do, do as I say. It works up, in, work up until the age of six. Well, not actually four, I said, in our household. Because the vet will tell you, if you're, I don't know, it's your dad, but you did it. That's what you said, Dad. Don't know what I'm saying. So just do what I tell you to do. It doesn't work that way. But we want to do this in our Christian, Christian walk. We want to tell people, don't look at my life, look at Jesus. That's not the gospel. Paul said to Timothy, you follow me as I follow Jesus. Yes. It's a cop out. To look at your friends, your family, say, don't look at me. I'm just a sinner. No, you're not a sin, you're saved. You're son and daughter. It's just a cop out not to be a standard bearer, to be a fruit bearer. Let him look at your life and say, listen, what you have, I, I want. That Jesus you serve, that's what I want. Don't tell your neighbor, don't look at me. 
He needs to see Jesus in the flesh. He needs to see this gospel work. He needs to see a church that's, that, that's alive in Christ Jesus. So I want to ask you guys, can I have all the dad's attention? Next Sunday is Father's Day. Next Sunday is Father's Day. And I want to ask you, will you invite the dad with you next Sunday? I'm not going to prepare a message, how to be the best dad ever. But we want to bless dads. And, and, and I'm not sure if I'm going to share what I bought for the dads. How many of you want to know? Dads? Do you want to know? Uh, I must admit, there's no enthusiasm. Can I, can I tell you? If there was dads going, yes, pastor, yes, I would have shared this to you. But you just look at me and say, well, I hope it's not soap. <laughs> I so wish I don't hope it's not soap. But dad, I want to ask you, would you invite a dad next Sunday? We'll end the service at 11. So when you invite someone next Sunday, you can say, listen, half past nine till 11, that's it. Because I know it's Father's Day. Family takes their dads out, whatever. He says, no, 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 my kids can take me. So let, you, let your kids take you out after 11. You can meet him at the restaurant. I will keep you my time frame. Promise you, 11 o'clock, we will finish. But I want to challenge men. Why don't you invite a dad? A dad. Don't invite a person that's not, that's not a dad yet, a hopeful dad. A dad. So that we believe, as we are praying, we're going to pray this week for, for dads, that God will touch them. Because there's a lot of pressures, pressure on dads. Because a lot of dads is not a person that gets the most money in the household anymore. Some moms get more money than dads. And dads that had the, the substance in the salary package, a lot of dads are just imploding because it doesn't work that way anymore. But we need to honor dads. It's still the head of the house. Okay? Thomas, I draw the broek. Oh, yo, yo, yo. Very serious. But I want to challenge you, dads. Invite someone next Sunday. Let's see what God is going to do in their hearts. I'm still going to minister on Reset Church. So I'm not going to pick on dads. Because there's many people in the Bible we can talk about. You know, David was a good warrior, but a bad dad. He was an absent father. So we're not going to do that stuff. We're going to trust by the Spirit of God that we can pray for them, impart on them hope. Say, Dad, you're still a dad. Amen? SH, come up, please. Come and give God just praise this morning. And if you...